Nice to see you today. It's uh, Wednesday, February 16th, and uh, welcome to the Common Good Podcast. On Wednesdays, we like to talk with uh, people of faith from around our world and ask them what compels them to the common good. Uh, and I can't be more excited than to be talking to Jana Reese today. Uh, she's a writer and a thinker and uh, somebody who's been uh, pushing for and making happen changes inside the LDS Church, the Mormon Church. And, and uh, Jana has been a, a real hero of mine. Uh, your book, Flunking Sainthood, is, is a classic. And uh, uh, it's been important to a lot of us. And so I just think, think the world of you. And so glad that you're on the podcast today. Thank you, Doug. Thanks for having me. It's an honor. And I can't believe that you do this every day. Wow. <laughs> you know, there are a lot of people who say the same thing. I can't believe you guys uh, think this is worth doing every single day. But we do. Uh, you know, yeah, I think it's worth doing. Say. Like, lots of things are worth doing, but wow, that's a big commitment. So. Every once in a while, we take uh, a weekday off, uh, and we do take off the weekend. So I, I, every we say it's a daily podcast, but it's only week, week daily podcast. So it's only, only five days a week. Uh, you know, it's like eating your fiber. You know, it's just the thing you do that's good for you. <laughs> Uh, all right, uh, Jana, we, we always talk about the weather on the opening of this for two reasons. One, it's just fun little chit chat. Um, and because I'm a Minnesotan, that's what you do. But also weather is one of the things that we actually all share. Like we all experience whatever's going on outside and whatever's happening in the climate. And with all the other divisions and all the ways that we slice up our lives to be so different from one another and live in such different experiences, the weather, my golly, it's just one of those things we all have in common. So today is going to be in Minneapolis, one of those cloudy days, but sort of mid twenties, uh, just sort of classic, boring old winter days that makes you, you know, just grateful that it's not thirty degrees colder than it is right now. What what are things like there in Cincinnati where you live? Uh I'm trying to be grateful for what we have here today, which is a lot of sunshine, and it's probably in the forties, which for us is great. Um, it's much better than it has been. However, this time last week, my husband and I were on vacation in a much warmer place. And so I'm trying not to, you know, think back like, what was I doing this time last week, sitting on the beach and enjoying, you know, total freedom. All of the things. Well, I, I, I'm going to do that next week as a dirty Good. little secret. And so I'm trying not to sit here and think, what will I be doing a week from today? So I don't know which is worse, remembering how free you felt or feeling like, you know, freedom is still uh, a week away. Uh, all right. Hey, Jana, uh, um, you've been an expert in writing about religion and actually religion and literature, which is something that I remembered after rereading your bio uh, little bits of your biography. Um, not, not you didn't write a bio. There's not a biography about you, but but your bio on on the internet. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about that? You know, you have this very rich um, uh, academic history. Can I just uh, brag about your academic history? You're um, a graduate of Wellesley College, which for a lot of people is a real accomplishment. But from there, you go on and get a theo theology degree from Princeton Theological Seminary, and then a PhD in American Religious Studies from Columbia University. So. Um, like, you know a lot about uh, religion and literature and the world that we live in and all of this. Um, just talk about that. How did you get into all this, all this work? Uh, you know, I've just always been a reader. I've always been a geek and been surrounded by books, not surprisingly, right? Um, and that's been my passion since I was a little kid, just mm. to Im immerse myself in both fiction and nonfiction. I read a lot of stories when I was a kid, but also, you know, a lot of nonfiction to explain the world. I tried to read the whole encyclopedia set that my parents had. I think I got stuck in like B or something, but but I, I fell in love with the idea of going to Andorra someday because I read and reread the Andorra entry in the A encyclopedia again and again. I don't know why I'm thinking about that now, but and, and, I will miss Andorra. And that, you know, not only sort of um, academic studies but some of your other books and writings have been things like uh buffy the vampire slayer and harry potter and like like that world what 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 is it that makes and well t tell us what you've done in, in writing around that and and what what gets you into that world and how do you think about faith and religion and literature when it's in that that kind of fantasy space those kind of fantasy spaces mm -hmm. you know i'm so glad you asked that question because it is 
the, the religion component is a very important part of fantasy literature and the whole genre of fantasy, the idea that you have something always, there's something mystical that's always lurking under the surface, you know, under the, the muggle world, there's going to be this other reality that is. Uh oh, well, there we go. That doesn't, that doesn't happen very often. Uh oh, and, we lost her. In an act of magic and fantasy, uh, <laughs> Jana Reese has just disappeared from the from the screen right in the middle of. Right in the middle there of we go. We got her back. back. It, it <laughs> was one of those fantasy magic experiences, and you teleported away from the uh, fr oh, from the screen and turned into just a, a shadow of yourself. All right, so so I got you up until the point you had said uh, religion is always uh, sort of a subtext and a and a and a text yeah. inside of the fantasy genres. Right. And it's, it's everywhere also. Like yesterday, I was interviewing an author who um, has written this fantastic book that I will plug here because I liked it so much. This is called uh, The Deep Places. The author is Ross Douthit or Douthit. I don't actually know how his last name is pronounced, but he's a columnist about politics for the New York Times. And the book, though, is not about politics. It's about living with chronic illness. He has Lyme disease. Anyway, this this is relevant to our discussion of fantasy literature because there's a really beautiful part of the memoir in which he discusses Lyme disease in the context of fairy tales and how in a fairy tale, people uh, are somehow trapped in a situation not of their choosing. They have something happen where their body is transformed. You lose your voice. You're stuck in a castle. You know, you, you would turn into a beast, whatever it is. It's something that you didn't want to have happen to you and that chronic illness is very much like that. I really liked the way that he delved into these fairy tales uh, and also said that Lyme disease itself sounds like something out of a fairy tale because there's this tiny little, almost invisible creature wow. that wreaks havoc in your life. You find it in the woods, you, you stray from the path of the dark and you are bitten, you're afflicted. I mean, it's so, so well written, it's so well yes. done. That that is some, yeah. I mean, what a what a great way to think about illness through the lens of fan, and also to think that you know that's a function that that fantasy has in a person's life and in our society. It's it's explanatory. Well, one of the questions I like to ask people around their faith and their religion, especially, um, I'm interested in this stuff. So I do ask the questions like, what do you believe and uh, how do you frame your beliefs? I mean, I spend a lot of time around that, but I'm most interested in all of us about what does your faith do for you? Like, how does it function in your life? What is it? What's its effect on you? And that seems to be something that fantasy also kind of wants people to explore, right? Like, um, how does the world impact you and how do you explain it? And, and basically, what's the context of the story that you're able to tell about that? Yeah. Ooh, that's a good question. You know, as far as my faith, I didn't grow up in a religious family at all. My family, you know, in, in the 1970s, we were uh, nuns, N-O-N-E-S, long before any of our neighbors were nuns, you know, long before it was popular or cool. My parents were very avant-garde, I guess, in that way. They were pretty anti-institutional. And I was very religious. And I don't know why this happened. You know, I don't know why a kid can be born into a deeply religious family and have no faith or the opposite, a ki yeah. kid who was born in a completely non-religious family, but has a deep belief in God that just doesn't kind of make a lot of sense uh, in terms of no inculcation, no, no teaching, but it was just there. I prayed when I was a kid before I even really understood anything about religion. And when I was in uh, at Girl Scout camp in the summers, you know, we would I would be there for two weeks, including the weekend in the middle. And I would go to the Saturday night Catholic mass and the Sunday morning little Protestant service because I was just so curious about religion and what people did and what they thought about it. And for me, it wasn't an obligation. It was something really fascinating and cool to discover. And I don't know why that is. I really, I think that some of the research that people are doing now into genetic predisposition, possibly that plays a role. Um, I wonder too, I'm an extrovert and that is very much a part of my story. And when you asked about what faith does for a person, I think it's going to be very different uh, for each person. I'm not so much an introspective, mystical or contemplative kind of Christian. I'm very much a Christian whose prayers are answered through other people, 
whose uh, foundational reason for being within a religious community is the community itself. The community itself is the point for me and not sort of the distraction from the point. Yeah. And Mormonism actually does that part really well. Yeah, well, I really want you to tell, tell that story and talk a bit about it and just want to add a little uh, a woman to that or a men to that, because I, I have a very similar experience, wasn't raised religiously and mm -hmm. uh, felt you know, got into it as a teenager very directly and had great impact on my life. And I've sort of wondered if maybe I've spent the last 45 years, 40 years, trying to understand that and maybe that's why i do this work uh, did you ever you ever ask yourself that that question like maybe you pursued a master's in theology and a phd in religious studies because you're still trying to piece together some of your own story about what why what is going on you know not only in the world and religion but inside of your of your own of your own experience and your own self Absolutely. I think that we are all, uh, to some extent, maybe maybe some people are more self-aware about this, but in terms of what academics study, what authors write about, and what careers people choose, it is very autobiographical. It is very much about how we're trying to somehow work out our own stuff through these decisions that we make. And you know, when I look at my uh, the books that I've written for the last 20 or so years, there is no pattern at all, except what was going on in my head, like what I was interested in at that particular time in my life. I never sat down and had some sort of branding plan. My books were all over the place. Like you said, I wrote a book about Buffy the Vampire Slayer because I'm really fascinated by uh, television and by the storytelling that television enables. I think that we're living in a golden age of television. Joss Whedon's uh, subsequent Problems notwithstanding, you know, I'm a big fan of his work, maybe not him as a person anymore, but um, but I think that he has some really interesting things to say about lots of things, but mm -hmm. power and uh, institutions and faith and friendship, a lot of interesting things to say about those things and heroism. You know? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, I'm sure that that um, wide range of book topics uh, that you've chosen to write on drive publishers and agents crazy, right? Because what they want, uh, and I've experienced this, is what's your brand? What's your thing? Right. How does this fulfill your brand? And for a lot of us, we're like, ah, it's, I don't know. That's that's not where my writing is going to come from. You, you've also spent right. time working for religion, uh, for uh, Publishers Weekly and the religion, religion side and writing about other people's religious writing. So you have this personal experience in it that you've been exploring, but you also have this wide palette of understanding of the religious landscape with a specific focus on the the Mormon church. And you've been one of the chief, well, she's disappeared again. I'll just keep talking and maybe she can hear me. Uh, no, she, it's, now, it's now turning into a prayer. I will just keep talking and wonder if Jana has heard me. That'll be the, uh, <laughs> it into a Jana Reese prayer and I was just talking hoping you were hearing me so uh but, but you, I think you can hear now because I can see you um you, you you have this expertise inside of the Mormon church uh as well and you're a, an adult convert to the Mormon church can, can you talk about that uh you know a lot of people they don't understand adult converts to any religion you know it's confusing for people because a lot of folks their religion is something that was passed on in childhood or maybe teenage years but adult converts and then you converted into a religion that had a whole lot of controversy around it like it wasn't one of the you know you didn't just become a you know a, a classic catholic in boston or episcopalian in uh yeah somehow she keeps getting disconnected on her end huh i don't know what is going on well uh good thing we can just talk and fill some time around here <laughs> so uh uh, so Jan, I was saying uh, we don't know why you keep disappearing, but you know it's our. I it's don't our know fantasy. why either. It just keeps dropping out. You, you're a convert into into Mormonism and and an agitator inside the system, and somebody who's helping to make a change. You've written about it and you participate in its very in its very changes. Can you tell us the Mormon side of your story. So when you said the word agitator, uh, something you know, an alarm bell went off in my head because that is something that you know, we can't be, we cannot be agitating for change. We can't be um, pushing in that way. 
You mean inside the Mormon structure, inside the Mormon church? Right. Uh, I, I'm trying to be careful about the wording that I choose here. What I do is write and point out things that could be better. I'm a one on the Enneagram. So, right, there's always stuff that could be better about me, about my church, about the world, about the way the dishes are loaded in the dishwasher. Everything can always be better because that's what perfectionism is about. There's the idealism component of perfectionism, and then there's the sort of uh, toxic component. And I think Mormonism actually has both of those embedded in the culture. Mormonism has uh, appeal to people like me, and par- I think this was part of my conversion, although I was not conscious of that at the time, uh, that it has this tremendous optimism about the perfectibility of humankind hmm. and about the, the, um, the beauty of the human spirit. You know, in Mormon theology, for example, Adam and Eve fell up, <laughs> falling forward. Uh, you know, Adam and Eve made a choice in order to allow for other things to happen that were better things than just being trapped in a garden in a perpetual state of of childhood. You know, in in Mormon theology, Eve made a courageous choice in order to eat the fruit so that they could have knowledge. That to me is tremendously appealing. And I, I really love that piece of our theology. There's also no original sin. You wouldn't really know that from talking to Mormons in the 21st century as Mormonism is practiced in my church, where we are very focused on sin and we're very focused on sex and we're very focused on gender roles and you know a lot of things that are pretty unhelpful in the long run. But the core of our theology is something quite freeing, I think, if we can just dig out some of the layers of culture and excavate that theology for a a beautiful new age, the Mm. 21st century age. So interesting. Uh, I would love to talk about that, the function of that creation story inside of a religion. Uh, But I want to ask you this. um, What what was your pathway in? How 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 did it happen? Who do, who did you meet? Who did you talk to? Where what what were the what were the circumstances around you finding your your pathway into the LDS church? Well, it was a very long story and you know, now that I I work, I'm a historian by training. My his, my training is the history of religion, but in the last 6 years I've moved over to sociology of religion for my academic life. And I'm now actually the president of the Mormon Social Science Association, which is hilarious. I'm not a social scientist. Um, So what a social scientist would tell you is that most people, the vast majority of people, when they convert to a religion, they do so because of kinship networks. They do so because of friendship. They do so because of relationships. And especially since I'm an extrovert, as I said, you would think that that would have been my path in as well. But actually, I really didn't know very many Mormons at all. My path was much more intellectual. It was based on the reading that I was doing. And that started when I was about 11. Um, And when I was in the sixth grade or between sixth grade and seventh grade, I took a little summer class called Nauvoo and the Mormons. This was in Western Illinois where I grew up. And so I signed up for the class because it had a field trip. We were going to spend the two weeks learning about Mormon history, whatever that was, Mormon people, whoever they were. But then we were going to go somewhere. And I was always very excited to go anywhere, you know, even if it was to an even smaller Midwestern town than the Midwestern town I grew up in. So I signed up for this class and I found myself being really unexpectedly interested in the subject matter. And I started reading. I started reading uh, some of the texts that we were looking at. And then when we went to Nauvoo, which was a really fascinating experience. Uh, Nauvoo, I should say, is one of the stops that the Mormons made on their long trek west from New York, Missouri, Illinois, and then finally Salt Lake City. And it it didn't really end well. This was where Joseph Smith was was killed in 1844, along with his brother Hiram. So, uh, and by 1846 and 1847, the Mormons are being forced out of Illinois. So it didn't end well. And when I was growing up, Nauvoo was basically a ghost town. You know, now it has become kind of a tourist destination and a pilgrimage site. But at that time it was, it was you know, very much left in its original uh, decay, state of decay. Uh-huh. So it was kind of an interesting place to visit at that time. And uh, I have this memory of a Mormon woman missionary who was part of, you know, a couple missionary, middle-aged, maybe, maybe their kids were grown, I don't know. 
what does an 11 year old know about how old people were? Right, know, they made 26 to you. That's right. 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 Um, and she saw me in the gift shop actually reading the Book of Mormon. I was standing there and reading the Book of Mormon. All the kids around me are you know, doing their thing and punching each other and whoever knows, but here I am just reading this book. And then when it was time to go back, I put it on the shelf and, and left the gift shop. She ran after me into the parking lot, basically chased me down. And she said, I really think you need to have this. And so she gave me my first Book of Mormon. It was very meaningful to me to have it. I didn't you know, read it cover to cover or anything like that, but I liked just knowing that it was there. Mm -hmm. And I continued to read about Mormons. I did in eighth grade and ninth grade have one Mormon friend. So I had you know, this one person who was br living briefly in our town. And I was kind of fascinated by her family, which was so different from my family, you know, praying together, having uh, meals every night together. That was a really big deal. And our family was much more catch as catch can, you know, we were like everyone's off in their different directions. And we rarely by that point sat down together to have a meal. So there were a lot of things that were appealing to me, but primarily for me, it was a, a very long and slow conversion through books. And finally, when I was 23, so like 12 years after this initial Nauvoo experience, uh, I converted. Hmm. Well, what was a conversion That's into a the Mormon point. church? But what, what does a conversion into Mormonism look like for an adult? How, what's, is that a formal, mm -hmm. I'm guessing that's a formal process? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, you can take the easy way or you can take the hard way. And of course I okay. chose the hard way, which is, I'm going to read the whole book of Mormon cover to cover before I allow myself to get baptized. And I'm going to learn the following things, you know, so I'm going into this with both eyes open completely. And, you know, I did tons of reading at that time. The weird part of the story is that I was studying to be a pastor. You know, you mentioned that I was a student at Princeton Theological Seminary, and it was actually at Princeton while I was a student that I became a Mormon. So the joke is that I entered seminary to become a Protestant minister, and I left seminary, neither Protestant nor a minister, um, had to find another kind of career instead, which it's interesting because now my best friends are pastors. And, uh, you know, it's like I'm constantly seeing the road not taken when I'm hanging out with them. And it's interesting. Yeah. And, so and, the and, hard thing was to do all this stuff. So and, and then there's uh, a declaration, a ceremony, that that sort of that sort of thing. Like I know Mormonism <laughs> takes church membership. Uh, it's, it's an important function inside of inside of Mormonism, unlike, I mean, lots of churches have members, but sometimes it's like go to a Saturday class and start tithing, you know, and that's it. You're a member. It's, it's different inside the Mormon church, isn't it? It is. And you have to be rebaptized actually. So even though I had been baptized into the Presbyterian church in high school, I was rebaptized into the LDS church when I was 23. And that was my, the senior year of my, uh, seminary experience and basically was was having this double life for a while where I was completing my education but on the weekends you know I was going to the LDS church and uh, one day my worlds collided when I ran into a fellow student at the chapel in the LDS church and it was horrible flying to me I mean it's funny to think about now because at the time I mean now it just seems of course that's going to happen that the thing was like a stone's throw away from where we were going to school. But at the time I was just desperate. Please don't tell everybody. It's going to make my life so complicated. And yeah. Mm. Some people might be thinking, well, why didn't you just become a pastor in the Mormon church? But there's a reason why people aren't mm -hmm. just pastors in the Mormon church. And it's not just that they don't allow women to be pastors or something like, you know, that happens in, mm -hmm. in some other uh, Christian churches. There aren't pastors in the, in the traditional sense, at least as a job inside the Mormon church. Yeah, we have an all volunteer local ministry at, you know, at the upper levels in Salt Lake City, there are people whose full time job it is to work for the church. And that bureaucracy keeps growing and growing. Uh, that seems to have no end to middle management and lots and lots of, of uh, documents that come out of that, that that people think are extremely important. But at the local level, it's still very beautiful in that everyone who comes to church is given some kind of job to do. It's called a calling. You have a calling at church and your calling is basically un, 
I, I don't know, it's, it's not unlimited, but it's not fixed how long it's going to last. You are just given this assignment, this responsibility, and then at some point, you don't even know when, that will no longer be your responsibility. And so in what, 29 almost years of being a Mormon, I've had many, many different callings, including working with kids, teaching adult Sunday school, teaching teenage Sunday school. Um, my current calling is that I'm the historian of my ward, which is my favorite calling ever, because that's the only one that I have any training for at all, right? This is, hey, something I finally know how to do. Um, yeah, they, they always say that the calling is uh, for your development, you know, that God has some sort of purpose in mind in this calling. You know, I'm, I'm not quite so sanguine about systems that I can just say, oh, of course, that's going to happen. Uh, and that every calling you're going to ever have is, is clearly purposeful. But for me, uh, my callings have been mostly almost entirely positive experiences. And when you are working closely with people in an organization, a volunteer organization, that's not just on Sundays, but often during the week as well, you do develop a closeness. The relationships are really strong. And that's an important part of my Mormon experience. A lot of people know Mormons by Mormons being out and about on their uh, their mission when they're somewhere around 18, 19, 20 years old. Did you go on one of those? Were you sent to another place as a 23, no. 20? I was already married actually. So by the time I converted, I was uh, married to a Protestant who is still a Protestant. And so the joke is that we are the uh, original Mormapalian couple. I go to church with him a lot. And in fact, I think there are some people there at his Episcopal congregation who don't actually know that I'm not a member of the congregation. It just, you know, in, in the Episcopal church, the boundaries of, of who is who belongs are far more permeable than they are in, in the LDS church, where th there's much more of a, an us them binary for better or for worse, you know, and that I think generally for worse. So now, now Mormonism is very well uh, understood as being rooted in Salt Lake City, partly because that's where the the headquarters is and there's a big magnificent temple there um, and a lot of people don't realize that a lot of religion in the united states has a regional vibe to it mm. um, you know there's people of every religion all over the place for sure but you know there's boston can be a very catholic place as can pennsylvania and you know certain yeah. parts of the, the south can be Baptist and certain parts can be more evangelical of, of our country. You think about Southern California or Western Michigan, like re religion is a regional and national and global experience in the United States. It's more pronounced in some places, like if you call your church the Southern Baptist, sort of hints where it is, or the Mormons yeah, are in Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. um, that's a clue. What, what does that tell you? Uh, like, so Mormonism as being in Utah, like, like that's not an accident, right there. I mean, the, you know, the old joke is they're trying to get all the way to the coast and stopped early, but the, 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 there was a wild West kind of feel and a, a fleeing from the, mm -hmm. what they saw as the oppression of the federal government on their religion. I mean, you talk about Joseph Smith dying, you know, in a particular town, Mormons have been a very troubled and persecuted group for much of at least the 19th and 20th century in the United States. How does that frame the, the religious experience of Mormons today? And then I want to ask you about what's happening in 21st century Mormonism. You know, I think it overframes, to be honest, because the persecutions that Mormons have experienced are so mild compared to what people of other religions experience to this day. And I wish, frankly, that more Mormons would, that Mormons would get out more, you know, that they would learn a little bit more about what people of other religions go through around the world. And uh, I think that the persecution chip on our shoulder is still very present in many ways. Um, and it, it's not a necessarily a very healthy thing. Yeah. Uh, in terms of regionalism, there are, it's impossible to separate gospel, what is doctrine, what is truth from culture. And that's true of all religions. But I think with Mormonism, it may be even harder 
because as you say, it, it was so tribal and so very located in this one locale for so long. And so the temptation is to confuse what happens with Utah cultural mores with everything from music to food to um, worship styles. And the idea is that that somehow is approved by God for exporting to all of the places where Mormons send missionaries around the world, rather than having some kind of give and take where Mormonism is not just trying to change those cultures, but be changed by them as well. That's a constant battle. You know, we talk about in, in the LDS church, we talk about the success of our missionary program worldwide, but sociologically, actually, when you look at the success of other religious groups that started in the 19th century and have been moving into the same cultures where Mormons send missionaries and actually uh, invest far more resources, Mormons are not doing as well as Seventh-day Adventists and not doing as well as Jehovah's Witnesses. And a, a big part of that, according to one social scientist, is that Mormons have not invested in local leadership. You know, the, the idea mm -hmm. is that leadership is top down and not bottom up ever, and that it needs to come from Salt Lake City. And so in, in well into the late 20th century, Mormons were sending white men around the world to lead people who converted in those other cultures around the world. In fact, it still happens in the form of mission presidents who are not from the countries in which those missions are located. And that's a constant source of tension. So how much uh, Mormonism has just not been open really to indigenous leadership much at all. And, and there's a lot of ways where the specifics of what goes on in Mormonism is a real indicator of a larger experience in the in in culture. You know, sometimes mm. you can see the whole by looking at the particular. Um, Mormonism, and you've written about a number of these topics, has gone through some real changes when it comes to issues like race and patriarchy and sexuality and gender and uh, leadership and age, ageism, uh, all of that. You've written most recently about you know, uh, the next Mormons, how millennials are changing the LDS church. And, and by the way, just people who don't keep up in their language, the, the LDS church is Latter-day Saints or, or the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints is also often called Mormons, which I know for some people can be confusing. You know, they might not know that. Um, but the LDS church is the, is the, I guess the official name, is that right? And, and well, the official, name, the, name? the official name is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is a mouthful. And in, since 2018, when Russell M. Nelson became the president of the church, there's been a tremendous push within the church to get rid of the use of the word Mormon and instead to say Latter-day Saint, or even better, to say member of the Church of Jesus Christ. And as a, you know, as a, a columnist, a journalist, really, writing for a religion news service, I've written several times about how we actually can't do that. You know, we, we don't get to say this is the church of Jesus Christ and all of those other people are just pretending, you know, um, that's a theological statement. And so we have had to negotiate what is the language going to be? And for, for me, it has been using Latter-day Saint more often than I used to, but also continuing to use Mormon, which is what our readers know. It's what they Google. That is how they search. And, you know, it's, it's an interesting discussion. Like why has this become such an important identity marker in the, the Nelson presidency. Is it something more than the smash Broadway hit, The Book of Mormon? Is it, does, it, <laughs> does it go further than that? Or is it like, look, we got to just change the name? Well, Not actually, kind of President Nelson, um, he, in 1990, gave a talk in General Conference, which is one of the twice annual big Mormon meetings where leaders address the faithful around the world. And he railed against the use of the word Mormon and proposed that we, we needed to get it out, expunge it from our vocabulary, essentially, this nickname he thought was offensive to Jesus. And uh, so it has been on his mind for three decades. And now that he's president of the church, he's in a position where he can okay. um, do something about it. So, so yeah, he's, yeah. He's, been, he's been bothered by that for a long time. I, I, I sometimes wonder if that's similar to the Quakers. Um, you know, the Quakers were called the Friends, the Society of Friends, uh, and they mm -hmm. were given the name the Quakers along with, I'm not joking, or with the Shakers at the same time, and the Shakers yeah. and the Quakers because they would um, speak up in a, in, a, in a Friends meeting 
when the spirits sort of moved their bodies to speak up. <clears throat> so they were called Quakers and uh, and not everyone thought that was a great term, but they just sort of took it on. And now, you know, you talk about the Quakers and they've owned it. Lots of religions uh, have have a nickname. It, it would be great, wouldn't it, if like any of the Christian religions were having to be called the Lovis or something like, oh, those people, they just love everybody all the time. You just have to call them the Lovis. Yeah. The, the nickname is the nickname you want to be known for. And Mormon is a nickname. You know, we are uh, we inheritors of this book called the Book of Mormon. Mormon was a person. Mormon was a character in the book and an editor of the book. Go editors. Um, but the early founders of the religion were nicknamed as Mormonites just because they were toting around this, this book of Mormon. And so that name became Mormon and it stuck. So, you know, I think President Nelson is correct that it's just a nickname. It's not the official name of the church. However, we're in a situation now, you know, nearly 200 years later, where that has become the word by which most people know us. And so you you can try and try to get rid of it and change language, but language changes very slowly and not overnight as the church seemed, you know, the church essentially instituted this very quickly within its own ranks and seems bewildered that the rest of the world has been slow to catch up. You know, that's a very naive understanding of how slowly language changes. Yeah, well, any of us who've tried to rename ourselves or the old Seinfeld skit, you know, when George tries to come up, you know, give himself a nickname uh, or, you know, the kid that's like, all right, I'm finally moving to a new school or my family moved to a new town. I'm changing my name and here, here forth, I'm going to be known as this. It's that's just really hard. Uh, it's hard, especially for a global religion over over all this time. Uh, what you wrote an article or a book, uh, rather, uh, the next Mormons, how millennials are changing the LDS church. What 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 are millennials mm -hmm. Right. So the the research, this was the sociological research that I was talking about before. And my research partner and I are embarking now on phase two of that, which is looking at people who have left Mormonism. The first book, The Next Mormons, was about young people who have chosen to stay <clears throat> and how they are um, sociologically similar to or different from their parents and grandparents in the United States. And there are some major differences. You know, Mormons are, young Mormons, young adult Mormons, millennials, and now Generation Z, are more conservative than their peers, you know, less likely to have sex before marriage, more likely to pray every day, for example, but far less conservative than their parents and grandparents. And so looking at the next Mormons book um, that was the, the first result of this research was looking at some of these generational differences side by side and saying, well, where are we now? And then the second book is, as I said, looking at people who've chosen to leave. And we are having, just like every religion is having right now in this challenging environment for institutional faith, uh, people leaving more than they used to. And that has become um, more of a more of a thing. And so this next book is full of interviews with people who have left and new data about why they they have left, why they made that choice. Not to steal the thunder from the book, but w what's your overall sense of why people are leaving? Can you do you do you mm -hmm. feel comfortable putting it in a nutshell yet, or are you still creating yeah. that little nutshell? Well, I I can put the phase one data in, in a nutshell, because we did have in that data 540 former Mormons as well. So we have some data about them and in the next wave, we'll have even more. But in that first wave, the reasons were not that surprising. And they're very similar, for example, to why evangelicals, young evangelicals say they have left evangelicalism. Um, in, you know, some of them are the classic reasons, like I lost my faith, I kind of, uh, couldn't reconcile my own priorities and values with those of the institution. But for millennials, the third most commonly cited reason for leaving was the church's stance on LGBT issues. And so that was interesting because that was not a factor for the older people who had left the church. It was not a factor for their parents or grandparents' generation of people who had left the church. Um, so Mormons are living in a time when society is changing very quickly and the church is changing glacially and that's a challenge you know you are told growing up that the men who lead this religion are prophets seers and revelators and that it's their job to guide you into 
the new age and their job to sort of scout out all of the challenges ahead and, and prepare you for that future. But then growing up as a young Mormon, you are seeing instead that it seems like often they are impediments to that change, that they are standing in the way of uh, things and clinging to a certain 1950s idealization of the American nuclear family. So what do you do? You know, and, and the church has unfortunately created, a, a, as I mentioned earlier, this us them kind of mentality where it's a binary choice. Maybe you're told the church is all or nothing. There's nothing else for you out there in the world. If you leave this church, you leave everything behind. In fact, I just today am writing an RNS post about uh, a pretty unfortunate talk that a church leader gave to youth a couple of weeks ago, a week and a half ago, in which this was totally the mentality. And when you grow up in an environment where you have always been told, um, if the leaders of this church are wrong about one thing, then they're wrong about everything. And you know, if the Book of Mormon doesn't yeah. hold up on all of these historical levels that we told you it's going to hold up on, well, then it. Oh, there she goes again. Uh, she has disappeared one more time. Yeah, this this conversation that she's having here uh, about what's happening in the Mormon Church uh, and the the sort of certainty that is supposed to come from religion. That, that I'm just recapping here. Uh, that this this question you're raising about the certainty of your religious doctrine and teaching, and if it faults in one place, um, yeah, that that's been a pitch that religion has chosen to make. And um, you know, there's a lot of people inside and outside of any religion that just say. You want to make that deal? Uh, you can go ahead because it's not gonna it's not gonna last very long, and it certainly uh, yeah. is true in the, in religion. Do you feel like it's more true in the Mormon uh, experience in the LDS Church than it is in some of the other um, Christian traditions or other religious traditions in the United States? You know, people in in church leadership would be quick to point out that numerically Mormons are not doing as badly as some other religions are in terms of disaffection and losses. But I don't think, I mean, that is statistically true. Mormonism was still growing at a rate of about 1% a year for the last couple of years, um, where so far globally, it has not seen these declines, but that hides a lot of other things uh, including the fact that in Europe and also now increasingly in the United States, the church is struggling, especially in urban areas and rural areas, not so much in the suburbs. The suburbs uh, seem to be doing pretty well, but numerically uh, the church is hanging on and kind of on that treadmill, but there is a crisis of confidence, I would say, and that has been exacerbated by the internet. You know, it used to be that if you were a Mormon and you were sitting in your Sunday school and you maybe had doubts and you thought, well, I'm not really sure that the Jonah story is supposed to be history. Maybe it's more just a story that's supposed to teach us something. You would keep that to yourself. Or maybe you would sit there and have those thoughts and talk about them with your family at home, but not publicly. And now you can go on to Reddit or you can go on to Facebook for any number of social media affinity groups and find lots of people with those questions and then many, many more that you never even thought to ask. And so that's been a game changer. Podcasts, infrastructure, retreats uh, for people who are questioning, people who are struggling and people who have left. For people who don't know the basics of more, just a little 101, can you talk a little bit about how Mormons identify as Christian or not, if they all do. And you mentioned there, you know, somebody reading the Jonah story, that the Old and New Testament of the of the Bible is something that Mormons also use and utilize mm -hmm. in addition to other other teachings, including the Book of Mormon. Just do a little recap for, you know, sort of the, the novices to, to Mormonism about its relationship to the other, like, do you consider yourselves a denomination, an expression of Christianity, a different religion? How, how do you talk about yourselves as, as Mormons? So what the church would say, and then I will get to what I would say in just a minute, but what, what the official stance of the church is that not only are we Christian, but we are the uber Christians. We are the inheritors of the church of Jesus Christ that uh, Christ himself instituted when he was on the earth and that we are the only church that retains to this day 
the prophets and apostles, the apostolic structure that Christ instituted when he was on the earth, that we're the only church that has the authority to perform ceilings in which families can be together forever in a temple, or they don't stay in the temple. The ceiling happens in the temple, sorry, dangling modifier there, and then the family is together forever in the celestial kingdom. Um, so the church teaches that other, in fact, this was part of part of the talk that I'm kind of dissecting in my RNS column for today, because I find this logic to be problematic in some ways. Um, but the, the church has officially taught that not only are Mormons Christian or Latter-day Saints Christian, but they are the uh, true church of Jesus Christ. This is the one true church of Jesus Christ. And that it was restored by Joseph Smith so that's the official party line. I have some issues with that. You know, I think that I'm a Mormon for a reason, and there are beautiful things in this theology and in the Book of Mormon that I can't get anywhere else. So I'm here because I believe that there are things here that are unique and that are beautiful and important. However, I don't think that when we say that something is true, we have to also mean that it is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, because Mormonism is an amalgam of culture, as I've just said. There are lots of adulterations of what is supposed to be some kind of pure gospel with culture, because that's how humanity works. We are human beings and we live in cultures and that's gonna creep in. There's no such thing as a pure, unadulterated gospel that is practiced by human beings. It just, we don't have that on this earth, so, you know, Sorry for the, the wake up call if, if that's important to you, but um, the challenge, the beauty of it is how do you get as close as you can? How do you approximate what Christ taught when you're living in this particular place and time and with these particular people? Uh, uh, growing up um, Mormon, Mormons often would experience Christians from other places, of other traditions being told those people are not real Christians. And Mormons sometimes might be hearing those people are Christians, but they're not really part of the true expression of faith. Those two worlds can collide in a lot of a lot of spaces and a lot of people's minds, right? This like, who's really the one that's in? It, it seems to me by my reading of the, the Gospels of, of, of the New Testament that that's sort of the least concern to Jesus about who's really in or not. You know, I mean, it, it doesn't really doesn't seem to be the thing that Jesus was all that all that concerned about. But lots of other religious traditions are, are quite concerned about that. Um, but it feels like that's changed a bit in modern days. Uh, you know, I don't know the last 20, 20 or thirty years that that this kind of binary about I, maybe people are still taught that Mormons are some false religion or that Mormon kids are really taught that, you know, your Presbyterian friend isn't, isn't really Christian. Uh, has that sh short of the talk that you're referencing in your, in your article today, is that on the decline or, or do you think just yeah. overall in religion, are we getting better at not doing that? Well, I don't know that we're getting better. I think that we are becoming irrelevant, right? <sighs> That's the sad reality. You know, 30 years ago when I became a Mormon or nearly 30 years ago, the, the anti-Mormon cottage industry within evangelicalism was a thing. And it was still a thing when I was working at Publishers Weekly uh, in the early, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, especially around the Salt Lake Olympics. There was a whole burst, you know, flowering of anti-Mormon literature at that time. And it happens when religions are successful. I mean, as a historian, part of my research was to study Christian science and Mary Baker Eddy in the, in the uh, late 19th century and very early 20th century, Christian science was the bomb in this time. I mean, when you go to an American city and you see a Christian science church that is in prime real estate in some you know affluent neighborhood in every city in America, right? That's because it was the thing and had all the wealthy converts. And Mark Twain was writing anti-Christian science screeds that are filled with, you know, really sexist remarks about Mary Baker Eddy and women leaders and all of this. And that's because this is what happens when religions are successful, right? When religions are making an impact on culture, that's when the fangs come out. Mormons are not doing that now. We are 
treading water numerically. We're not poaching evangelicals from their churches nearly as much as we were accused of doing 30 years ago, et cetera. And so yeah. the ire has moved elsewhere. And meanwhile, religion in general has become less and less relevant. People are not concerned about which church is true, you know, which church has the best priesthood. They're thinking, why care about religion at all? How would this help my life at all? Uh, regardless of which religion we're talking about, just why religion, full stop. We, we spend a lot of time here talking about the places where religion impacts our collective life, our civic life, and our politics. Um, Love your thoughts on how your faith pers- you know, calls you to the common good, and also just any commentary you have on the role of Mormonism in politics. You know, a lot of people have been very worried about evangelicals again in the last five years because of their role in electing someone to the presidency that I think was not only the greatest expression of hypocrisy to evangelical teaching over the last 50 years, but a real devastating effect on just the well-being of, of people on the pla- and the planet itself. So there's a lot of people who really are bothered, as you say, like they're bothered by evangelicals as we should, as I think they should be, and, and I am an evangelical, but bothered by evangelicals because of their power to select and to endorse uh, a president, right? So even if your church isn't big, that you can show up the ballot box in a, in a unique way and have uh, power that way raises the appropriate, you know, uh, suspicions and and critiques and and demands for change. What's going on in Mormonism around uh, around politics and all that, and, and how does it pursue you into your own expression of the common good? Oh, that's a great question, and it's a complicated one because. You know, the majority of U.S. Mormons did vote for Donald Trump in both 2016 and 2020, actually particularly in 2020 because there was no uh, third party LDS establishment candidate that time. Whereas in 2016, there was Evan McMullen and a lot of Mormons voted for Evan McMullen in 2016 because he was a traditional conservative and really not. uh, Donald Trump was distasteful to many Mormons for a lot of reasons, you know, the, the uh, braggadocio, the, the overt sexual predatory kind of behavior. This is not traditional Mormon values, right? Mormon family values, um, having three wives and, you know, children by five children, whatever, by three different women, also not uh, traditional Mormon values, or at least <clears throat> 20th century and 21st century Mormon values. We could talk about polygamy and, and you know, what Mormonism was like in the, in the 19th century, which was quite different in many ways. But <clears throat> for our purposes here, the issue is how does a, a deeply establishmentarian and conservative uh, family values oriented religious movement, a Mitt Romney religious movement deal with Donald Trump? And I think Mitt Romney is a great example because he did stand up to Donald Trump, and he was the only member of his party to vote for impeachment. Um, I was very proud that day, and my column in the Religion News Service uh, that day was basically about, thank you, Mitt Romney. You know, thank you for representing my faith. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with Mitt Romney on much politically, but he recognized the danger that this man posed and the things that he had done that were clearly in violation of what it means to be a democratic nation. And he had a lot of courage. Also, Senator Jeff Flake, while he was still in the Senate, Senate, Senator Flake from Arizona, similarly had uh, the courage to stand against his political party in order to oppose Donald Trump. So there, there is the minority report. It's a strong minority report that sounded the alarm about Trump and did so very early on. But I think that that, that uh, conservative culture of almost a libertarianism that is heavily influenced by the, the Mormon tribalism of Western Americana we talked about a little bit, yeah. that's very strong as well. And what we see now is polarity that was exacerbated during the pandemic. The church, you know, President Nelson, who is in his, he's now 97, mm-hmm. and when he became the president of the church in 2018, he was 93. Uh, when the, I know, right? Uh, we, we are a gerontocracy. When the pandemic hit in 2020, it, 
Mormons were saying, wow, how wonderful that we happen to be led right now by a former cardiothoracic surgeon who spent, you know, before he became a full-time leader of the church, he, he had a very uh, a well-respected career doing heart transplants and studying medicine. And those same Mormons then turned around when he started saying, we need to cancel church and you need to wear masks and we all need to be vaccinated and said, what the heck, you know? And yeah. that's been a really interesting thing to observe because as a progressive Latter-day Saint, I have for many years been writing about how progressive Latter-day Saints deal with things when we disagree with church leaders who are supposed to be speaking for God. For libertarian or conservative Mormons of a certain bent, this was the first time that they'd ever had to go through that. Like, mm -hmm. wow, the prophet is clearly influenced by big pharma, you know, or he, he is, mm -hmm acting under the under the control of some ridiculous state you know all sorts of conspiracy theories about why president nelson might tell people to get a vaccination it's like he's a doctor right it's not a conspiracy I remember polio you know he was actually a doctor when there was a polio vaccine for the first time that's how old he is maybe you should listen to him yeah that 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 is a great point as as a uh, you know progressive evangelical i'm often asked um how many of you are there progressive and evangelical it feels oxymoronic to people they feel like they're you know evangelical just means conservative uh, religious christian person progressive yeah. mormons is that the same way do people ask you a question like progressive mormons uh you know do you all have to rent a minivan when you have a national meeting or do you do you get a bus or how like how, how many of you are there I've made that joke myself because every spring I go to this retreat of uh, basically Midwestern Mormon feminists. And the joke is, please don't bomb our retreat center because that would decimate our entire community. Like, okay, the 68 of us or whatever that, that come on to this uh, retreat center on a particular spring weekend every year, that's it. That's all we got, right? Yep. Um, but actually, it is bigger than that. And the internet has, as I mentioned, helped people find each other in new ways that, that didn't necessarily exist before. Since the 1960s, there has been a, a really wonderful academic journal called Dialogue, a Journal of Mormon Thought. And that became a locus for a community. Dialogue still fulfills much of that purpose. They are doing Zoom Sunday school for people who feel kind of unfulfilled in their uh, regular uh, little pabulum church Sunday school experience. And they have a guest teacher every Sunday on Zoom. You know, there's a book club, lots of ways for liberal Mormons now to kind of get together no matter where they live. It used to be you were the only person in your ward probably and you didn't have much of the community. And now that possibility definitely exists. It's still a minority. I mean, statistically, as I said, I've done this research about Latter-day Saints in America, and probably we're talking about one in five. Uh, we asked a question, for example, about how many people who are still active in the church have doubts about key elements of Mormon belief, and that was 17%. So uh, most of the people, I think, who have doubts of a serious level do wind up leaving the church, but roughly one in five of people who are sitting in the pews may be progressive or in mm -hmm. some way doubting their uh, received tradition. And I'm sure it's true in the LDS churches, it is in a lot of the other churches. I know that sometimes a, a person could be the only progressive, you know, uh, practitioner of that faith in their family. Like they're, they're a standout even inside their own family system and their own, like the loneliness that comes from being someone who is trying to still express your faith as something that opens your heart to love and to goodness and to human betterment through the work of your own hands and the spirit of God. Like that, a lot of people still want that and they don't want some of the other things that come with it and they don't know what to call that. So a lot of people just kind of leave or quietly in their heart, they just make a little shift and they say, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going along with that anymore. I'm going to, I'm, I'm just going to keep my lips quiet on that bit and be silent uh, or speak up. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's a real tough thing. And I'll just thank you on behalf of all the other um, Mormons who find solace and encouragement in your public expression of this. I, I'm guessing it's not easy, you know, uh, even saying yeah. at the beginning that you like, you know, 
agitation is not the thing that you are, uh, you know, that's, that's not built into your system is a thing that people are, no, is, okay. is not a washing machine that uses an agitator to free up the dirt so the fabric can live in its fullness, you know, that that's just not the metaphor. So it's difficult to do this, isn't it? To be a public voice um, and trying to, yeah. trying to make sense of all this. It's exhausting. And I, you know, <clears throat> I'm the only Mormon in my family. And it's that that propels me to continue doing the work that I'm doing because I'm speaking for a lot of people who can't speak for themselves because they would profoundly hurt or um, you know, hurt someone in their family or maybe be estranged from their family for speaking out about things like this. So, you know, I keep doing what I'm doing. Well, occasionally I'm for it. You know, occasionally something happens and I'm thinking, oh, I'm really glad I have I have a column where I can write about how I feel about this because I've got to get it off my chest. But more often than not, it's a job. You know, I'm a columnist and I write a certain number of columns a month and I am uh, doing my job, right? And people can follow you, of course, on Twitter. You're uh, you're active there mm -hmm. and uh, well well worth the follow if people are, are open to someone else. And uh, on your own website, what, where else would you direct people to uh, to look if they were interested in uh, keeping up in your work? So Religion News Service, my column is called Flunking Sainthood. Uh, you mentioned that I wrote a book called Flunking Sainthood. And at that time, like in 2010 or 2011, the advice in publishing was, oh, everybody needs to have a blog. So, and you should call your blog after your book so that they have this brand associated with it. Well, that was a total disaster because the book is a memoir about trying all these different spiritual practices. The book is a comedy and yeah. it's a kind of lighthearted, funny read. And it's not about Mormonism at all. And the uh, column is primarily about Mormonism. It's not necessarily funny. The, the branding just did not work here at all. Yeah. Well, it's they can, uh, not but you are funny. And uh, so I think you should write more funny stuff. So uh, you're, you're a good writer. And uh, Jana, thank you so much for being part of this. Thanks. Thanks for your for your good voice. And, and uh, it's great to talk to you. Yeah, thank thanks. you. Okay. Bye bye. All right, everybody. Bye. All right, but now this time you should disappear for real. This this time it, it works and makes sense. All right, we'll see you. Uh, hey, so good, so good. Um, Dan, anything else from you, my friend? No, nope. she's really great yeah, conversation. Really, Loved it. Isn't she just? She's just great. I just think about all these people that we get to meet, you know, and um, in this conversation, and all the different progressive voices that are finding a way for faith and life and common goodery. Uh, in the world, there's there's a lot, and there's sort of no no end to it. Um, so, on that note, we'll be back tomorrow and again on Friday. Uh, so, thanks for being with us today, and we'll talk to you then.